Howdy everybody, my name is Deward Cater and welcome to my final update on the application of optimal estimation methods to disease modeling. I would like to thank my sponsor, the online REU program at Texas A&M University, as well as my collaborators, my mentor, Dr. Ulysses Braganetto, and the grad students, Yukintan and Levi McClenney. So as I'm sure we're all aware, there is currently a COVID-19 pandemic that is sweeping across the world. And due to this, we have a great need for accurate ways to estimate how this disease will spread. Now, our original goal was to use incomplete and imperfect testing data to predict how this would spread over the entire state of Texas. But due to computational constraints, we are limiting this to the campus of Texas A&M University. So the way we're going to approach this is with the use of an agent-based model. This will be created in the Python programming language. And what this does is provide us a grid of individuals with their own various states. And this yields us a state space agent-based model now this is very similar to a classical cellular automaton in that it possesses a transition function that dictates how the individual states will evolve over time. Now this transition is probabilistic in nature and it possesses a few more properties that differentiate it from a cellular automaton and make it agent-based that we will talk about soon. And the advantage of such a model over classical ones is that it provides both spatial as well as temporal information. So what I have on the right is an example of a cellular automaton known as John Conway's Game of Life. I will not go into too much detail on it for the sake of time, but I strongly recommend looking it up in order to understand how a cellular automaton functions and thus how an agent-based model will work for us. In John Conway's game, we have the same grid of states and each grid, each cell, has a neighborhood which is basically just the cells around it and it updates itself based on whether the grid its neighbor is black or white. So you can see how such a model could be useful for modeling the, the spread of diseases based on its evolution over space and through time. So the model we're going to use for the campus is based off of the SIR disease model. This stands for susceptible, infected, and recovered. The susceptible individuals have yet to catch the disease and are able to do so. The infected have caught the disease and are able to spread it to others. And the recovered have recovered from the disease and are now immune to it. We have on the right several buildings, each with their own variable size grids based on the number of individuals within them. The susceptible will be colored in green, the infected in red, and the recovered in gray. And what separates these from classical cellular automata and makes them agent-based models is the ability for movement swapping. Movement is handled by swapping cells between buildings. As we will see, only three buildings begin infected, and the only way for other buildings to become infected is for individuals to move between them. Now this is the engineering district of the Texas A&M campus, but the model does have the ability to model different areas with variable movement probabilities based on the distance between the buildings. So from this campus model, we are able to generate population plots of the susceptible, infected, and recovered individuals. We have here two different plots based on two different infectious susceptibilities, which are just the probabilities of getting infected after coming into contact with an infected person. This first one is for a probability of 10%, whereas the second is for a probability of 5%. These probabilities can be changed based on factors such as proper mask wearing and social distancing. And we can see just a small change in 5% greatly flattens out the infected curve and leaves many more people from becoming infected. So from this, we can see how important such measures as masks and social distancing can be. Using this campus model, we would like to be able to simulate real-world spread of the disease based on testing of the students. However, the number of tests is usually very small compared to the size of the population, and the test results are not always 100% accurate. This yields what's known in electrical engineering terms as an optimal estimation problem. In the Boolean sense, the exact solution of this is what's known as the Boolean common filter. However, in population sizes on a college campus, the exact solution is often computationally too intensive, so we must move on to an approximation scheme known as particle filtering. I have a video link here that's hopefully in the video description as well. It gives a very strong intuitive sense on how particle filtering works. Essentially, we have here the original campus model from the previous slide. And what the particle filter does is makes, say, 100 copies of this and updates them all based on the same function that updates the original model. And then, based on the few number of tests, each particle is weighted based on how accurately they agree with the test of the original model. I'll play this. So we have the original model on top and the estimate on bottom. 
it's kind of hard to follow based on the large number of individuals in the simulation, but we'll see in the next slide plots that give accurate information on how it operates. So here we have two comparisons of the BKF particle estimate to the empirical estimate, which is simply the ratio of the number of positive tests versus the total number of tests taken at each time step. In this first plot, we are assuming that at every time step, say every day, the number of tests is equal to every single individual. That is to say, we are assuming that every day we are able to test every single person. And if we are able to do so, we can see that the empirical estimate tends to be slightly better on average than the BKF estimate. However, this is not entirely accurate as it is very unlikely we will be able to test every single student on every single day. So a more realistic number would be say 50 tests of students every single day. But when this happens, we can see that the empirical estimate tends to become much more chaotic and lose its accuracy. And because of this, we can see that the BKF becomes much more accurate due to the nature of its memory, whereas the empirical estimate only takes snapshots of the current number of positive tests to the total number of tests at every day. So let's jump into a slightly more realistic scenario. Let's assume that we will be able to keep the probability low enough that the number of infections will slowly decrease throughout the semester. If this were not the case, and if the number of cases were spiking, like in previous graphs, it is likely that campus would shut down all face-to-face -face interaction and everything would go online. So we'll make the assumption that proper mask wearing and social distancing are enforced and we are able to keep the probability low, such that infections will tend to decrease as the semester goes on. In this scenario, we can see that the empirical estimate becomes even more chaotic than it was previously. As the number of infections remains low, the number of tests to the ratio of the, of the positive tests becomes much more chaotic and inaccurate when we have very few tests to use. So due to this, the BKF becomes a much more accurate estimate than a simple empirical ratio. Now this is due to the memory factor that the BKF possesses, which the empirical test lacks. That is to say, the BKF remembers the number of infected individuals at the time step before and uses that information to update itself more accurately on how the model should, up, should ha handle itself at the next step of time. The empirical estimate does not measure this as it only takes a ratio at every given step. So from this, we can see that the BKF and its memory factors are far more accurate in a realistic scenario when we have very few tests and when probability of infection remains relatively low. In conclusion, we have set up a state space agent-based model that tracks the spread of the disease and accounts for student behaviors such as movement and campus geographic information such as building proximity that accounts for the probability of the student movement. This model is useful in providing SIR population curves which show the effect of changing the probability of becoming infected by other individuals. This is useful in showing that proper mask wearing and social distancing can have profound effects on the number of infected individuals on a college campus. On this model, we then applied BKF particle filtering that is used to estimate the spread of the disease. In real world scenarios where the number of tests are very small and on the campus where we assume that the probability of infection is very low, this BKF estimate is far more accurate than simple empirical estimation based on the ratio of positive tests to the total number of tests. The next step for this project would be to generate a more full map of the Texas A&M campus and apply more buildings to it in order to more accurately portray how the campus would evolve over time. Thank you for listening.